Good morning. Wilkinson here. Today, my guest is Larry Dean Harris. He does a lot of stuff, but this is a long list, but he's a freelance copywriter, consultant. He's a playwright, a writer, a storyteller, a great listener. That's probably number one, he tells me. And he's the, also the producer of Strong Words. Say hi, Larry. Hi, Larry. <laughs> Don't be smart. All right. I'll be stupid. All right. Glad you're here. You've been in Palm Springs, you said, about two years. Yeah, it's the best place to, especially to, to endure uh, a pandemic. Oh, yeah. So we, you would have arrived in the middle of it. I didn't think of that. Yeah. I, I rode the pandemic out with, with books and swimming pools. Wow. I called you Larry, but I think I'm going to switch to Larry Dean. It Thanks. sounds classier. I don't know. I'm going to do that. Sounds good. So tell me what Strong Words, What what is that? Strong Words has been going on for about 10 years in Los Angeles and about three, four, five in Palm Springs on a limited level. It's a storytelling show ostensibly, but it's really a community of people who come together to share stories and to enjoy each other's company because we don't have a lot of opportunities to do that after a certain age. You know, if you want to go to a bar, sure. But, you know, beyond the bar scene, where can you go and, and talk with people like you? Strong Words is that outlet. That sounds very cool. In fact, I went to my first one last week and that's where we met. And I said, oh, got to have this guy here and, and talk to us. It was a great night. Yeah. So what is your favorite thing to talk about? I know you got a million things you can talk about, so I'm going to let you start, at least start it off. I'll give you that. Most of my stories start with my childhood. Growing up in a small rural community, I was raised in the church, and that certainly uh, provided some crazy stories to share. And I'd like to compare and contrast my youth with, with my current life and the things that I've learned as a result Perfect, because that's kind of what this podcast is doing for me. Cool. <laughs> that we're right. So you grew up where? I grew up in Lemoyne, Ohio, this tiny little burg, little farm community outside of Toledo. Uh -huh. Literally grew up next to a cornfield. And then what? <laughs> well, so, so you're gay. We're both gay. Yes. Yeah, is that a part of the? Is that part of the program here or uh, what? Oh sure. Um, so how was it being gay in Ohio? Were you gay in Ohio? I was gay in Ohio. And at one point, you know, it was a slow coming out process for sure. Um, because in a small farm community, nobody was gay, of course. Uh, so it took Well, they didn't talk about it at yeah. least. <laughs> it took going to the university yeah. and then moving into the city to sort of get more comfortable. And then uh, the AIDS epidemic happened. And I suddenly became very publicly gay when I got involved with our local AIDS organization. I was speaking on the radio and occasionally television and doing fundraising events. And uh, my best friend used to call me the gayest man in Toledo because I was sort of the poster child for the local AIDS cause. And all this took place in Ohio. You went to school in Ohio? Yeah. Okay. Then I snuck off to New York for a year in the late 80s, and that was an experience because New York was very uh, sketchy back then. It was, you know, drugs and guns and prostitutes, and Times Square was not Disney. It was midnight movies and peep shows and right. just a whole different experience than Lemoyne, Ohio, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and then from uh, New York, you went to L.A.? Nope. I, I oh. went back to Toledo. I went to New York and I went, this is insane. I need to go back to my roots. And I went back to Toledo and used what I learned in New York to sort of build a, an interesting career. I started performing and writing a show. I wrote a silly little show called Oh No, Not Toledo. And it was literally a <laughs> joke when I started. Yeah. Um, I had a great mentor in my first job and he's still we're still very good friends and uh i said to him i said wouldn't it be great if toledo could make fun of itself so that other people didn't have the opportunity and he took that to heart and he called me one day and he said you know that show you wanted to write making fun of toledo he said well i sold it to the owens corning national sales convention you have two months get Whoops. writing <laughs> wow yeah wow and because this man believed in me, it started the ball rolling. 
and uh, we were a huge hit. The show ran for years. I got to hire all my friends from college, and and we were the toast of the town. We got to play. Um, we performed in front of six thousand people at the, this giant amphitheater. Amazing opportunities for these kids in their late twenties. You know, it was it was wild. How large was the cast? It was five people and Same. me, and we are forever bound to each other. We don't see each other maybe every 10 years now, but whenever we do, it's like we pick up where we left off and I just, I love them all. So from that show, what's one of your favorite parts? Give us a, give us a snippet from it. Oh my gosh. I'll put you on the spot. (laughs) Or is it too far back? Oh no, no. We had, there was a song about, about the ritzy town of Perrysburg and Perrysburg was where all the old money was and the lyric was uh it was back when everyone wore kelly green and and navy blue clothing country club clothing and uh, crap it was something about you know trying to find the perfect husband and it and the the best line was as long as he has cash flow an asshole will work fine (laughs) oh ouch and it always got a huge pop from the audience and how did the people in uh Ohio take that. They loved it. And surprisingly, the people that we made fun of. They loved it. Came to the show. The mayor, um, the local newscasters. And it was always a treat to have them in the house. And they always laughed. Nobody, you know, it was kind of an honor to be poked fun at. How old were you when you came out? I forgot to ask you that. Uh, Unofficially 17. Okay. So you returned to Ohio from New York. Yeah. How long did that last? It lasted five years, I think, and it was it was amazing because I had grown up while when I went away, and I came back. I I knew who I was, and I had purpose, and I started. I was creative director of an ad agency by day, and at night I was directing high school students in musical theater, and on weekends I was doing my show and playing in a band, and I had this incredible group of friends, and we'd hang out at the local coffee shop, because right then coffee shops were starting to be the rage, if you remember. Yep. And it was just this incredibly rich time of my life, and it was really hard to leave all that. And one day I just realized there's more out there. Okay, before you go into that, though, so you do you have family there in Ohio? Uh, some, yes. They've, they've kind of scattered about the Midwest now. Immediate family? Were, any, were you around any of them? Uh, Parents, siblings, that kind of... Yeah, my family... <clears throat> hard to talk about. Uh, now, they're not all gay, I assume. No, nobody, <laughs> nobody in my family is gay. Um, well, how do they like gay Larry Dean and especially <clears throat> coming back grown up gay Larry Dean? How do they... How do... You know, I give them great credit I asked my sister one time, I said, when did you know? And she said, we just knew a little more every year, Hmm. which I thought was really interesting. Hmm. Um, Don't make me cry on your podcast. There you go. Is that your older sister? Yeah. But my family, they're pretty cool for the most part. You know, my dad, we have some rough spots, but uh, it provides great fodder. My dad is in plays and stories, and I think it kind of tickles him that he's he's such a muse for my writing. I wrote a whole play about my dad called The Prodigal Father. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the crazy <laughs> thing is, if you remember a TV show called Barney Miller, there was the a character... The name I remember, but I don't remember the context of it. Well, there was this character named Wojciechowicz, and he was kind of the dumb guy, you know, the good-looking dumb guy on Barney Miller, and it was played by this man named Max Gale. Well, Max Gale shows up and auditions for my play to portray my dad on stage. Whoa. Which was (laughs) incredible. And you said he was good-looking. Oh, my God. People came to the theater to see him. him. Yeah, because they all they all had crushes on him growing up. And let me tell you, Max Gale is a person. He's an incredible human being. And every night after the performance, he would thank me because he loved being in a play. And I would just thank him because having him in my play changed everything about it. He really embodied my dad. He brought this incredibly cool spirit to the space. Because he just he just was an extraordinary human being. And so your father had to like that. Yeah, he got a kick out of I it. I mean, that you had a cool guy like that there. Yeah. You know, I had a TV star playing him on stage. So wow. yeah, 
he had a kick out of that. I guess so. Okay, now I'll let you go back. So then you were getting antsy being in Ohio. You loved everybody, but yeah. then what? Made a trip to L.A. on a lark and mm. got off the plane and took one look around and I said, oh, this is where I belong. So 1997, mm. I packed up and I moved to L.A. Didn't know a soul. Found a great place to live in Silver Lake and just became part of that entire community. I, I discovered a, a wonderful organization called the Playwrights Kitchen, and it was full of people just like me, playwrights and actors. It was founded by Dan Loria, who was the dad from the Wonder Years. Okay. And so I immediately got to be part of this incredible workshop experience where every Monday night people were bringing in new works and actors were getting up on stage. And I didn't have anything like this in Toledo. So it really was the impetus to sort of get make me serious about being a playwright. And so you had a daytime job, I assume? Yeah. Thankfully, I'm pretty good in advertising. And so when the internet happened, I realized I could do what I was doing in Toledo anywhere. And so... Now I have clients all around the country. Every once in a while, I combine uh, my marketing background with my theatrical background, and that's kind of fun. I read, I did a little bit of reading before we got together, and there was one point where you had, I guess, a pretty successful advertising campaign for glasses, but you never showed glasses in it. Yeah, isn't How did that, that crazy? Work? How did that work? Yeah, because the client gave us a lot of freedom, and we wanted to do something that was very pro Toledo because they were a prominent optician that was in Toledo only. And they were, they were up against all the big national chains. So we really wanted to make it clear mm -hmm. that they were locally owned. And so we created this whole campaign called See Toledo, See Toledo's Eye Doctors. And so the idea was each spot, we did three, was a different scenario. And one was, believe it or not, two guys driving to work. And I got to hire my dad as an actor to drive his <laughs> truck. And it was all the sights that they see on their way to work every day. Duh. And they were wearing glasses, I assume. Yeah. Yep. That's kind of genius. Yeah. And it was just, it was just an amazing opportunity. And life sometimes, if you let it, falls into your lap like that. You mm -hmm. just have to recognize the opportunity. Right. All right. Now I'll let you go back to LA. So you're at the uh, the new playwright group, then what? Yeah, and um, <clears throat> six playwrights, we, we decided to, to come together and form our own theater company, which had never happened. You know, most theater companies were a group of actors would get together. That's how you got Steppenwolf and Actors Gang and all those kinds of things. But we were like, we want to be a theater company run by playwrights. And so we formed Playwright Six, and mm. we put on... 10 years, I think we did 20 productions, which was a that's, pretty good run. That's pretty, that's pretty good, yeah. Yeah. To a year. And we did some crazy stuff. We did, uh, we partnered with the local gay and lesbian theater, and we did this series of shows called Christmas Time is Queer, because we wanted gay people to have their own Christmas experience. And every year we would write six different brand new short plays and put them up. And the third year, we got amazing reviews the first two years. And we thought, oh, well, we'll never get great reviews again. So let's make a lot of money. So our third year, we said, okay, Christmas time is queer, naked Christmas. All the plays are naked. Have to what? have a naked character. What? Because naked sells. You know that. <laughs> You're in Palm Springs. And so <laughs> we did naked Christmas. And let me tell you, not only did we make bank but the reviews in like the LA Times were raves. Just this crazy idea of combining nudity and Christmas. Wow. <laughs> now, were you an actor as well? Uh, once. Okay. I truth, had an actor truth be who, told here. Let's have it. <laughs> I had an actor who got a national tour in my play, and it was like, oh, I don't want to go through the trouble of recasting and rehearsing. I said, I'll just go into the play. So you were naked. No, not that I didn't do the no, no, oh, I that, wouldn't have done on, the naked show. Wanted. No, no, sorry. <laughs> um, but I will never forget one of our actors, <laughs> right before we were to go on stage, she grabbed me by the shirt and she pulled me into her and she goes, don't fuck up and pushed me out on the stage. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was and, my and trial you, by and fire. And did you? And I didn't, no. You didn't, okay. Good. It's not my favorite thing. 
acting. I love storytelling. That's a whole different beast. But acting is hard because hmm. you, you have to dig deep and you have to memorize. That's the hardest part. I'm old. I don't want to memorize anything anymore. Storytelling, yeah. I've got pages in front of me. So if I you know, get a little lost, I've got a, I've got a prop. Yeah. So you said one of your earlier, you told me that your, one of your favorite things was listening. So yeah. is storytelling or listening your favorite, which is it? I love to talk to people. I love to get their stories. And that's one of the reasons why I love strong words, because I'm helping people share their stories. And, uh, <clears throat> this is, this is kind of an interest, interesting sidebar. I hope you'll indulge me. Of course. I was hired by a pharmaceutical company that had made this very promising cancer drug for ovarian cancer. And they wanted me to create some type of live experience, an event, to help people understand what it was like to have this ovarian cancer. And they assigned me two of their employees who had both lost their mothers to ovarian cancer. Mm. And I was to interview them. So we started the interview process and both of their mothers just sounded really interesting. And so instead of talking about cancer, I just kept saying, tell me about your mom. You know, when was the first time you fell in love with your mom? You know, when is the first time you realized your mother was like this extraordinary person? And I mean, the tears just started flowing. The stories were incredible. One, her mother... Um, had, had moved to New York from Peru and worked, you know, cleaning and worked her way up and got a job in a corporation as an assistant and, you know, had this extraordinary life before she passed. And I realized I don't want to talk about cancer. I want to talk about the lives and show people what we lost exactly. by losing these extraordinary women to cancer. Mm -hmm. And it, we ended up doing a play in the round for all of these sort of, you know, if you know anything about sales reps, you know, they make a ton of money and they're kind of cashy. Right. You know, they, they, they're, they're into the dollar. When they left that room after the show, I think it changed every single one of them and made them realize it's not just about making the money. It's about changing people's lives. And that's what storytelling can do. Well, the one I went to last week was very powerful. I will give you that. <laughs> yeah. The great thing about storytelling, too, you know, we'll put six different stories on a stage and it's like, even if you don't like the storyteller or you don't relate to what they're talking about, there's another story in 10 minutes. And exactly. maybe that's going to be the one that grabs you. On right. a perfect night, all six will grab you and feed mm -hmm. your soul. Mm -hmm. That's that's to me is the goal. I always want people to come away and just feel like they're a better person from knowing these stories. Well, I think it'll be a success here. It was pretty packed, as I recall. Yeah, we're going to do it again, July 12th. You're uh, the first to know. And I will be out of town. <sighs> Could you reschedule it? <laughs> well, I hope your listeners come. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to put all of the, in the in the episode notes, we'll put all the links to, so you can, yeah, you have a really, really long list of stuff we can send people to. So we'll do that. Cool, cool. So what else would you like to talk about? My gosh. Throw, throw something else out. What do I want to talk about? Um, I want to talk about why does everybody in Palm Springs drive 15 mile under the speed limit? Those are the snowbirds. Oh, good Lord. Things move faster in the summer. <laughs> I moved to the south end and it takes me forever to go two miles in this town. <laughs> but, but they only drive slow on the left fast lane. Exactly. Yeah. But they always manage to find another car to, to run neck and neck with. They, yeah, they just... Like, they just pace each me, other. Just yep. let me through. I really, I think it really does get a little better in the summer, though. Little bit. Little bit. Little yeah. bit. But you know, I'm very, um, I'm very optimistic about the turnout from the show last week. I think, I think this community needs a storytelling event, and we're not the only one, by the way. There are the brothers of the desert. I love these guys, and they're doing the same thing. They're sharing stories of gay African American men. They're putting it out there and they're getting great response. Mm. I think, you know, in today's swipe left, swipe right, TikTok world, I think there's still a place to sort of slow down, turn off your phone and just soak in a really good story and let it, you know, just let it flow over you for six, seven, eight, nine minutes. Of all your stories, and there are, what, hundreds? <laughs> Seems I know, like it. I know there's a lot. What, what are a couple of your favorite ones? Why don't you, um, why don't you just give us a sample here? 
My favorite story is, and you'll appreciate this, it's called I Found God in a Cornfield in Southern Indiana. And it's sort of about my, it's a survey of my religious experiences from growing up in the Pentecostal church to going to work at a Catholic high school and having the principal, a father, make a pass at me. Wait a minute. So you grew up in a Pentecostal church, yeah. and they sent you to a Catholic high school? No, no, no. I got a job working in a Catholic oh, okay. high school. I was going to say, and I'm they, a... I grew up on the same type of thing, and they were the enemy. You would never go to a Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so you're working there. Gotcha. Yeah, my first day on All the right. job, the All priest right. holds up a pair of school underwear and says, I'll give these to, if, to you if you put them on for me. And Ooh. I was just like, what? Well, how long did it take you to put them on? I didn't. <laughs> and thankfully, it was during the whole um, what uh, Clinton boxer versus briefs so discussion. Were they bo- were and, they boxers and they were or briefs. They were boxers, and I said, "Oh, sorry, I wear briefs." So that was sort of my out. But and then the next day, he had briefs, right? No, <laughs> I just I couldn't believe that would happen in a school, a Catholic school, no less. But you know, and then and then the story progresses. How I sort of found this amazing Jewish family, and. They are my family. I love them. You know, they take me in and I I, I know Yiddish and I uh, observe the, the Jewish holidays. In Ohio? or In it? Ohio, okay, yeah. really? Okay. Yeah. Um, so how old were you when he made the pass at you? 22. 22. Okay. Yeah. And did he ever do anything again? No, that was just the one. Huh. But I kind of made it clear, you know. That was a no. Yeah. But I didn't stick around. I, I f- finished my contract and I was out of there. And then years later, he got busted, of course. But he's still a priest. Yikes. Isn't that crazy? So how did you find God, though? You said you found God in yeah, the cornfield. It, so. <clears throat> I was at a family reunion with my dad. And my dad gave the, the prayer at the family reunion. And I remember being moved to tears by his conviction. Hmm. His prayer was so beautiful and lyrical. And uh, afterwards, I told him how proud I was of him. And that's when I realized that God was in me. God's grace f- was flowing through me by being able to sort of put aside everything else and just tell my dad I was proud of him. And in this tiny little uh, reception hall in the middle of a cornfield, and then, of course, you know, the story ends with... Um, And then I had a second helping of my cousin Charlene's banana pudding, because (laughs) um, when you're open to the idea, God can appear to you in many forms. You saw God in the banana pudding. Oh, yeah. If you, (laughs) oh my God. Yeah. At the, at the reunions, everybody lines up for the food table, except me. I go straight to the dessert table and load up on Charlene's banana pudding because it's that good. Wow. Wow. Well, plus you never know if a meteor is going to hit. You might as well eat that first, right? Hell that yeah. They say? yeah. Hell yeah. That's my favorite story. Now, the audience favorite is something tawdry, and that's a whole different thing. But uh, Well, I'm trying to keep it somewhat G-rated on here. Oh, you are? And Can, I, Did I say the F-bomb already? Oh, that's fine. That's, okay. That's okay. Can you tell that story... And have it be suitable, or do we need to move on to another one? No, no, I can tell. The story's basically called Confessions of a Calvin Klein Underwear Model. That sounds like fun. Yeah. And it's a true story. And that's all I'm going to tell you. What? That's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Where do we go to hear that? You're gonna, <laughs> so you're getting us to come to the storytelling to hear yeah. it, right? Yeah. Huh. When the audience demands it, like usually if there's, if we run uh, out of stories before the time is out, somebody will yell, tell the underwear story, and I will. It's a bonus. All right. Now you're you're totally jipping us here. A little bit. You got to pay to hear that one. All right. All right. We'll put that one on hold. So let's, you must have another one because you have a bunch. Come on. Well, it was interesting. I was going to tell a story the other night. Well, that's, that's kind of serious. Let's, let's stick to the fun stuff. I have a great story about when I was a kid, I had a, I had a stutter, not a stutter. I had a lisp. And I went through years of speech therapy with this German woman who was always trying to get me to make my tongue do these just ridiculous configurations that no human being can do. And then it was horrifying because all the other kids made fun of me, you know. And then I changed schools. And in seventh grade, I get called over the PA system to report to the office for speech therapy. And I was mortified because I'm like, oh, my God, already the stigma has followed me. And I walked in. That's kind of like a 
poor kid getting called to come and pick up your food stamps or lunch boxes yeah, or, yeah. or something like that. You right? know, and you know how yeah. in high school kids right. are in junior high, the kids are cruel. You don't want to stand out. You don't want to. I walk in and there's a young woman and she says, what seems to be the problem? And I said, well, I have I have trouble with any word that starts with the letter after R. And she said, well, what have you been working on? And I showed her, you know, curl your tongue and all these other dumb things and put your teeth together. <laughs> and, da, da, da. and she goes, well, just try this. She goes, swallow your spit and just push the letter through the front of your mouth like you're blowing a kiss. And I went, you mean like, Sss. and she goes, yeah, just do that. I think we're done here. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what? Six years of hell. And she saw, she fixed the problem in about five minutes. And that actually worked. And it worked. Oh my God. Isn't that crazy? Did you send her to the uh, German, was it a German lady you said? Yeah, no. You know, when you're in seventh grade, you don't think to, you know, to get revenge, but. Well, too bad they don't have Yelp back then, huh? Yeah, they didn't have Yelp for teachers, so. There you go. Well, that's amazing. Right? I mean. And you think about these things, and here's the best part. You get up and you tell these stories, and afterward, people come up to you and say, that was my story too. I told a story the other night about donating sperm to a lesbian couple. And sure enough, a fellow came up to me and said, oh, I did that three times. That was my story too. That's when you know you've hit gold. That had to be my friend Tom. It was your friend Tom. Yes. Did we just out Tom? No. Uh Uh-uh. (laughs) <laughs> he he talks about it. Yeah. And now Tom is taking my storytelling class. Yeah, he's he's pretty amazing. He's a good storyteller. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. So when you connect with an audience like that, that's when it's all worthwhile. That's when it's worth, you know, setting up the chairs and bugging all your friends to come. And it's a wonderful life. You're not going to get rich. It's not like writing a Hollywood blockbuster. So do you have a real job too? <laughs> well, the advertising <laughs> yeah. is my real job. Yeah. And that pays obscene amounts of money for silliness. And you can do that from here. Yeah. Where are most of your clients for that? All over the country. I even had a client in Israel once, which was crazy. I finished the project. I sent it to him. He okayed it. And the next morning, the cash was in my bank account. I thought, why can't I get my local clients to pay that fast? Right. Everybody else is 90 days. You know, I got money from Israel in like less than 12 hours. Yikes. That's a good one. Yeah. It's a good life. So do you like daytime job or your evening job better? Or are they so different that you couldn't make them compare? You know, I'm a Gemini. And so everybody sort of has these dual career paths, I think, when they're Geminis. And I enjoy both. But I really love, I love bringing other storytellers onto the stage. I don't always tell a story. And I'm okay with that. It's a lot less work when I'm just hosting and introducing other storytellers and finding them. So that's the really rewarding part, especially when people are telling a story for the very first time. You know, either they've taken my workshop or I just, you know, they submitted a story and I liked it and I thought I'll give them a shot. Uh, We've had people from the audience say, you know, I've never done this before, but can I send you a story? And I'm like, sure. And I'll give them notes and help them sort of craft it and tighten it and make it a little better. The hardest part about storytelling, which, which not a lot of people talk about, is you have to be a ruthless editor. Less is always more. And a 3,000 word essay will bomb on stage every time. A good story is 1,000 words, maybe 1,300 I have a hard time translating that. So if you're a normal talker, what is 1,000 to 1,300 words? How long is that? It's about 8 to 10 minutes. 8 to 10 minutes. Yeah. So you want a short story in less than 10 minutes. Yep. After every show, my audience comes up to me and they tell me the best story and they tell me the longest story. You never (laughs) want to be the longest because the longest is never the best. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. Rule of thumb, less is more. My memory's lagging a little bit here, but... I think before we started the podcast, I asked you, why did you, why did you start Strong Words? And I don't think we put that in the podcast, did we? I don't think we did. It's like why you were, and I liked what you were saying about it as far as community and stuff. So, so just speak a little bit about that if you would. Why did you start it? 
Well, when I started telling stories, I was doing shows around town in L.A., and there was a great show in Hollywood called Sit and Spin, and there was a great show on the west side in Santa Monica called Spark. But there wasn't a show in my neighborhood, in Silver Lake. And we had this extraordinary group of people at my gym, the legendary bodybuilder's gym, which has been there for decades, is full of talent. You know, like Bud Court from Harold and Maud worked out there and just all these amazing individuals, artists and story writers. So I really started Strong Words to get the guys at the gym an opportunity. And then we just kept expanding from there. But it literally started with three guys at the gym. Got up one night at a, a lamp shop that a friend of mine owned. And we invited all the other people from the gym and our friends and we told our stories and everybody said, this was really cool, let's do it again. And that was 84 shows ago. Wow. Yeah, not counting Palm Springs. And you said you did it to build community as well. Yeah, I mean, people come back again and again. I asked at our last show in LA, I said, how many people have seen 30 plus shows? And the arms just went up. Wow. They come back again and again. We wouldn't do it if they didn't. So what are the most popular ones? Are there ones that have you sitting there bawling or laughing or is, I'm assuming it's a mix, but is there a, is there a rhyme or reason to any of that? The people who are really funny, but also understand that they need a message, I think are, are always audience favorites. The story that, um, everyone continues to talk about a friend of mine who is trans told his story and it was funny and it was poignant and at one point he started reading the names of trans people who had been murdered Mm. and you know that just wrecked everyone in the room but it was it was showing a life that most people don't have any idea what it's about And when this person finished, the place was on its feet and just cheering. It was amazing. So that's been five years ago since I heard that. And I still remember that night. Uh, It was just so powerful. Mm. So what would you like to tell my audience? (sighs) Come to a show, first of all. (laughs) I mean, just to experience it. Maybe it's not for you, but if you've never been, or even if you've listened to The Moth on the radio... It's not the same thing. When you're in the room, it's a very different experience. Well, it's a different energy. Yes. Yeah. And it is palpable. Right. You feel it. And the audience connects with the stories. I love a good vocal audience. Heckle me back. I'm good with it. You know, let's have a conversation. There's nothing like it. It's why I've been doing it for, you know, at least once a month for the last 10 years. Well, other than my July vacation, which I haven't had one in four years, but of course you're doing two while I'm gone, right? One in LA and one here, right? Yep. Thank you. I don't suppose you will change the dates, right? Probably not, (laughs) but we'll take August off and then we'll be back September. Sounds good. Ready to rock. And our holiday show is like nothing else because we, we do five holidays in one night. So we've got, you know, we've got Christmas, we've got New Year's, we've got Hanukkah, we've got Uh, holidays for people who don't celebrate the religious holidays you know we try to put it all into one amazing experience and you're going to continue in palm springs i assume yeah based on what i saw last week hell yeah all right larry dean thank you for coming in it is my honor good guy it's been fun and i'm looking forward to going and listening to these shows they're great i appreciate you so much thank you